Today is a tale of bristling biceps and nine pack abs. We're going to talk about one of the most batshit insane members of the Astra Militarum to have ever graced the galaxy in the Emperor's name. We'll be going into Imperial Guardsmen that spend their off hours doing bicep curls, tricep extensions, and bench pressing while hurtling through the warp at whatever unimaginable terror is waiting for them. Now we've gone in on the Death Corps of Krieg as a grim, fatalistic, if not outright zealous regiment of an Imperial Guardsman. We've talked about the resolute and staunch nature of the Cadians, but today we're going to talk about a regiment that eschews a lot of the standard Imperial Guardsmen practices. In the earliest editions of Warhammer 40,000, building an army of Imperial Guardsmen meant you were drawing directly from this pool of Rambo clones, the Katachan Jungle Fighters. They used to be the only models really that were available in mass for the Imperial Guardsmen. As the 5th and 6th editions came out, we finally were granted some units with shirts, and Cadians became the standard issue soldiers of any Imperial Guard army. Um, that isn't to say you couldn't uh, field uh, Vestroians or Valhallans, you just you had a limited amount of them, and I think I remember them all being metal from what I recall. That's not to say that the Katachan jungle fighters were left in the dust, nay, they are still prominent in both the tabletop and the lore. Imperial Guardsmen without peer, the Katachan are taller and bigger than not just other Imperial Guardsmen, but any other human in the Imperium, save of course the Space Marines, but even then, Katachan jungle fighters have similar frames. So one thing out before we jump into the, the, the thick of this actual video is the pronunciation of Katachan. I've heard it pronounced Katakan. That was in like a in an audio book that came out in like 2016 or 2017. But I'm gonna stick with the way I've always pronounced it, which is Katachan. If you prefer pronouncing it a different way, it's totally on you and not, not a big deal. Um, if you guys can show me multiple audiobooks that say it's Katakan, I'll switch to that. But for me, it's Katachan. So grab a protein shake and dive. let's dive deep on a regiment that is going to lead to an innumerable amount of bodybuilding and gym jokes. Katachan is a planet unlike any other in the Imperium. In the past you've heard me use terms such as death worlds to describe a lot of the other worlds that the nascent Primarchs were flung to across the galaxy. None of them compare to the hellscape that is Katachan. Pre-Golden Age Man first discovered the serene jade gem amongst the stars in the early years of man's foray into the stars. The first colonists crash-landed on the planet and had to scrape a living between constant attack from the voracious jungle and finding food to scavenge. The majority of the colonists died, but the ones that survived became an altogether different type of man. Under constant threat, People of Katachan had to deal with a planet-sized tropical jungle clone of Australia. Everything wants to kill you on this planet. Uh, everything. Uh, brain leaves are hostile foliage, foliage that actually takes over the mind of people who touch its leaves. Uh, Venus man traps, which are gigantic-sized Venus fly traps. There's large, spiked, and barbed plants that turn their victims into another plant for anyone unlucky enough to get attacked by their spines. Uh, frogs whose poison can eat through power armor, heretic ants, all manner of beasts, creatures, and plants that are just waiting to make a meal out of any human that they find. But one of the most fearsome creatures on the planet is the Katachan Devil, which is basically a centipede mixed with a scorpion. They're fucking horrifying. Revered by locals as a disgusting display of raw power and ferocity, there is even a reputable unit of Katachan fighters named after the monstrosity. An interesting aside, it's believed that the Katachan Devil is an extremely old Tyranid organism that lost connection to the Tyranid hive mind, thus becoming feral, which would make a lot of sense since this thing is absolutely torn out of a Lovecraftian absinthe-induced nightmare. And in fact, I believe in like 4th or 5th edition, you could actually field these uh, in Tyranid armies. But calling Katachan a death world almost seems like cheating by comparison to some of the other death worlds out there or the ones that we've talked about. The indigenous species are so hostile that the planet doesn't even have a planetary defense force. Tyranids and orcs won't bother invading, and we'll go into what happens when demons come cavorting around these parts with them. Their fancy hooves and brass necklaces that they get from the city. But as you can imagine, this planet spawns a pretty stocky breed of human as a result. Standing well above normal humans and with a frame that is engorged with multiple amounts of creatine and whey protein, Katachan soldiers are hulks of gnarled muscle and grimacing faces. 
often called baby Ogrens, they are some of the most fearsome fighters in the Imperium. And although they don't have the coordinated standard military prowess fighting style of, say, the Cadians or Death Corps, their preferred methods of warfare are no less deadly and effective. With a planet that wants to devour them at all times, Katachans are unnecessarily prepared for any and all dangers that come their way. Skilled trackers, excellent hunters, and fearless in the face of any adversary, Katachans take to exacting the Emperor's wrath with a sort of reckless abandon, hooting and hollering their way into conflicts with heavy flamers and large hunting knives, like hollering rebel yells and shit. But these knives, which I might add, are so renowned that orcs hold them in high regard, and Katachans would rather lose their knife arm than the knife itself. They are taught how to make them at an early age and spend their entire life with their hunting knife, honing them, sharpening them, and learning to use it as, in a cliche turn of events or words here, an extension of their own body. To give you an idea of how bad things are on this planet, half of the children don't make it beyond the age of three. Further, another half don't make it beyond the age of 10. So being born on Katachan means that you have a 25% chance of actually seeing adulthood. So every morning, any of the more distant towns have to use a flamethrower to beat back the encroaching jungle that's like looking to just devour everything. I mean, I don't think I can stress enough how constantly under threat these people live in. In an interesting juxtaposition though, the people of Katachan have to be just having insane constant roided out sex because the population of the death world is actually quite high i mean we, we which we'll find out when we discuss a little bit further the amount of spawn per family is huge um, one of the more prominent characters is one of 10 brothers so i think that that's another thing is that there's a high probably because of any kind of mutation or or uh, adaptability from being on the planet there's a high fertility amongst the inhabitants of katachan but in addition, they provide dozens of regiments to the Departmento Munitorum every year as part of their Imperial Tithe. Just like Krieg, Katachan's resources are devoted solely to the production of troops for the Imperium. I mean, so much so that they will use additional regiments as bartering chips for more supplies back to the planet. I mean, without any form of agriculture, the only means of eating, I mean, outside of extraterrestrial food, which sounds like biscuits, that aliens give you, but I just mean imported, would be to hunt any of the other creatures through the jungles, which we already established are pretty goddamn dangerous. And this in turn leads to the style of warfare we've come to expect from Katachan jungle fighters. Elaborate traps and enfilades on the enemy as they lay down overwhelming firepower on their enemies caught in the ambush. The 8th edition army book seems to imply that their larger frame allows for the Katachans to heft shells into place much quicker, uh, allowing for, and I quote, a near unending rain of shots, which is a cool bit of imagery. But how is a fighting force that's so fiercely independent in their daily bicep curls organized? How does one command a regiment where every warrior grew up skinning insect demon beasts? Well, the regimental organization of the Katachan jungle fighters is quite different from your standard rank-and-file Imperial Guardsmen. Rather than being promoted through perhaps special station or, or birthright maybe, the Katachans elect their own officers much in the same way their tribes all over Katachan operate, with the Katachans electing their uh, governing bodies. But sergeants, colonels, captains, lieutenants are all assigned by a voting process from the other troops. The command structure and thusly the leadership of the Katachans relies heavily on a strong trust that their COs are individuals that the entire regiment has chosen to lead them. On that very same coin, all officers of the Katachans lead from the front, much in the same way that we heard from Krieg, but they will fight just as hard, if not harder, than any of their subordinates, oftentimes earning renown for taking on the hardest foe one-on-one. -on -one. Even further, Katachans do away with the typical finery and metal adornment of anyone of any significant rank, instead choosing skull tattoos for five years of service, or a long knife tattoo for ten years of service, or a tribal tattoo for fifteen years of owning a 4x4 and a lifted truck. Any actual medals or indication of rank are often tarnished with soot and dirt, soot and dirt <laughs> so they don't glint in the light while sneaking up on enemies. To say that the Katachans have a rub dirt in it kind of grizzled attitude is a huge understatement. These guys are tough as nails from the base guardsmen all the way to the commanding colonel of a regiment. 
Interestingly enough though, sometimes the entire command structure are all related, and it's not uncommon for brothers, uncles, fathers, and even grandfathers to have all served together, each under their elder. And again, this plays heavily into the discipline and leadership, relying on the trust of their superiors. And as you would imagine, this leaves little room for commissars in the Katachan jungle fighters. Commissars are issued by the Officio Perfectus, a branch of the Departamento Munitorum, and as thus are not born on Katachan. This creates an immediate distrust amongst the regiment. How can a regiment whose abdominal muscles are honed in the humidity of Katachan ever follow someone that does not know how to survive, adapt, or execute flawless preacher curls like they do? This has created a large amount of tension between commissars and the jungle fighters. This is similar to what we get with the Death Corps, how the commissars are of little use to a regiment so devout. In the case of the jungle fighters, commissars are seen as a nuisance and are often killed while on deployment with the Katachans. Uh, odd mishaps like the commissar falling 10 or 8 times on his sword while running backwards, you know, little things like that. The Grander Imperium, though, doesn't really seem to overly mind this as the Katachans are extremely effective at what they do. Making up the elite core of the Katachans are the Katachan Devils. These guys are the closest that the regiment gets to actual stormtroopers, but they're named after one of the most feared beasts on the planet that we talked about a little bit earlier. And take the already insane skills of a normal jungle fighter and crank them up to 11, because these guys are essentially one-man armies in and of themselves, racking up impressive kill counts as they stalk their way towards their prey. Often deployed as a vanguard ahead of the main, ar main army, they will harass and terrorize the enemy, picking apart patrols, sabotaging supply lines, harrying the enemy. Uh, they're often used as like a scouting force to find where the enemy is and attack them while the, other arm while the rest of the army catches up. Before we move on to one of the Katachan's more famous engagements, it's worth pointing out that heavy flamers and snipers are found in droves in this regiment. Katachan snipers are some of the best marksmen in the entire Imperium, able to stalk their prey for weeks before finally taking a single shot then disappearing into the night, kind of like a Vindicare assassin, only way less more indoctrination. Now, one of my favorite standout instances, or at least engagements, for the Katachan jungle fighters would be the Third War of Armageddon. And there are a large band of jungles that span across the entire equator of the planet Armageddon, where tons of feral orcs live. These are left over from the Second Armageddon War, where the only way to properly eradicate the poopy fungus people that are the orcs is to completely immolate a planet, typically at least. If one spore exists, an entire orc population can crop up from it. Hell, there are even feral orcs on Katachan that the jungle fighters hunt for sport. During the Third War, Commissar Yarik, the acting commander of the defense of the planet, stationed two full regiments of jungle fighters to fight at the equatorial jungles at Cerebra base. Now this didn't sit too awesome with the Steel Legion's own native Armageddon orc hunters, but we're not talking about a regiment of poncy dapper chaps with cream cover colored overcoats. We're talking about batshit crazy Sylvester Stallone clones hopped up on pre-workout. The Katachan jungle fighters took to their task immediately, even treating it like they were on leave. The dense, humid, and dark jungle of Armageddon was a welcome sight to the men raised in a very similar, if not same, environment. Despite the fact that the orcs outnumber the Katachans 30 to 1, they fought a constant war of ambushes and guerrilla strikes against the orcs. At one point, the orcs had actually completely surrounded and cut off the jungle fighters from Cerbera base, something that most witnesses think was intentional. <laughs> Free from dealing with the superiors at Cerbera base, the Katachans took to doing what they do best, hunting through and purging the jungle. Raging fires lit the night sky as wildlife screeched and retreated from the onslaught of Katachans through the feral orc breeding grounds and hideaways. The inferno was stemmed by the wet and dank nature of the jungle, which allowed for a controlled burn through all of the orc bases. The result was so well received that Yarik positioned the Katachans at the jungle throughout the entirety of the war, initially starting a huge rivalry between the Armageddon orc hunters and jungle fighters. But as the conflict dragged on, they began to rely on each other to stem the massive tide of orcs from Gazkol's mighty Wa. Now, having talked about the organization 
and a famous deployment of the Catachans, I want to dip real quick into the loadout and aesthetic of the Catachans, since we kind of did that with the Cadians and the Decor of Cree. And if you've seen the models, you know that these guys basically wear camo pants and a vest, or a tank top, that's really what they do. At the same time, they have the same armor value as a Cadian, which is noticeably clothed in armor from head to toe. The book kind of answers this point of contention that explaining that normal flak armor would weigh down a jungle fighter, relying on their instincts and quick reflexes, Catachans eschew the heavier armor to help them better ambush or infiltrate an enemy position. One of the only standout features that every Catachan wears is a single red bandana tied around their head. This symbolizes the blood oath that Catachans swear when they first join a regiment, wearing their fierce loyalty around their head as an overt sign of dedication to their superior officers that they so trust. And we've talked about the combat knife that all Catachans wield, but outside of these two things, there is no other uniformity amongst the regiment. They all have varying clothing as best pursuit or suits each soldier for their preferred movement around some of the most deadly environments in the galaxy. Which is actually another reason they don't wear significant armor. A dehydration and being slowed down in a jungle or equally as hellish landscape would negate any benefits the armor would give. Besides, when you can reflect bolter shells from your bristling arm muscles and girthy neck veins, who, who even needs flak armor? As far as the ascetic, Catachans borrow heavily from the imagery of US troops during the Vietnam War with variations on the standard uniform being cut and modified per each soldier dealing with the humid climates of the locale. Further into that trope is that the close similarity to the overly done up caricature of that age, or well, I guess to the 80s and early 90s, through movies such as Predator and Rambo. I mean, there's even a character called Sly Marbo, which we're just about to get into. Essentially, you have an entire army of Green Berets, all just as crotchety, grisly, ball-crushingly insane, and adorned with half a cigar that they bark orders through. Now, there are a lot of notable members of the Catachan Jungle Fighters, from Colonel Straken, Colonel Strike, and Gunnery Sergeant Harker, but one of my absolute favorite characters in not just the Catachans, but the Imperial Guard as a whole, is Sly Marbo. Obviously, this character is modeled after Sylvester Stallone and Rambo. Hell, Marbo is an anagram for Rambo. Again, the IG community has even drummed up a ton of facts that compare to the Chuck Norris facts from way back in the day. He's pretty beloved, and if not brazenly over the top at times. But then again, this is Warhammer, so I think we just all kind of expect that at this point. But his past is a rather tragic one. Marbo was inducted into the Catachan 7th Regiment along with his nine other brothers. And like I said earlier, this was quite common for brothers to serve amongst one another. The orc warboss Urgok led a massive wa across Ryza, and the Catachans were deployed to help stem the green tide. During one of the engagements, all the brothers were killed save for Marbo. Having lost his family, something snapped in the young guardsman, and he wasn't seen or heard from for an entire week after. When he showed up, the orc warboss's head, a single bullet hole in between the eyes. From there, the legends and myths only get wilder. Originally a Catachan devil, Marbo has become accustomed to fighting alone. In fact, that's really his only way of fighting. He is rarely deployed amongst other guardsmen unless to shadow and help protect them. Otherwise, he is off on clandestine missions to assault entire enemy forces. Truly a one-man army, he was deployed on Galabad fighting a massive Dark Eldar incursion. Cut off and surrounded by Dark Eldar, he dug in for a long fight. By the time other Imperial elements had come to the aid of Marbo, they found him completely surrounded by Dark Eldar corpses, destroyed vehicles, and the man himself covered head to toe in Eldar blood. A grim spike jutting out from the mess of corpses adorned with the Dark Eldar Archon's head. Now this insane motherfucker even booby-trapped an entire ravine to come crashing down on an alien army before he could finish off the leader single-handedly. Sly Marbo's legend is so extensive that he has earned the Star of Terra, basically the Imperium's Medal of Honor, multiple times, but with little fanfare, fanfare from the man himself. Sly is an, an enigmatic figure throughout the lines of the Catachans. Anytime he is not directly deployed in combat, he is seen moving somberly through the closest friendly outpost or base. His eyes have a kind of a thousand yard stare and he has an air of sadness that pervades him. He never speaks, only with a 
grunt or a nod to accept new orders. And this is very uncharacteristic for Katachans. Katachans are pretty loud, they're pretty boisterous, uh, they're, they kind of laugh and flaunt in, in, the, in the face of danger. Whereas Sly, the guy who's just jumping into the most danger possible, doesn't really even speak. So this is very, very contradictory to the way that we typically see Katachans. Now, he has even been compared in size to that of a small orc. His frame belying even that of the already huge Mr. Olympians that make up the rest of the Katachan army. Marbo is seen as the epitome of what it means to be a Katachan jungle fighter. The man doesn't use any fancy gear or take to the hunt using some relics of the regiment. Instead, he simply uses whatever he can carry. An accomplished marksman and hunter, he brings the right tool for whatever job it is. His preferred loadout is his ripper pistol and his envenomed blade. Using these two weapons, he stalks his prey, patiently waiting to ambush them or pick them apart one at a time. To this very end, he is deployed to missions that would require an entire regiment or padre of assassins. During the aforementioned Third War of Armageddon, Marbo was ordered to guard an entire industrial wasteland alone, battling and destroying entire companies of greenskins. In more recent history, Sly Marbo destroyed chaos encampments during the 13th Black Crusade, the inhabitants of the camps having been killed by either sniper shots or explosions. Which is actually a great segue into what's happening now with the Katachan jungle fighters. Remember how we talked a little bit about uh, demon incursions earlier? Well, after the events of the Sasatrix Maledictum, they've definitely had their hands full. A number of the primary worlds that the Imperial Guard used for recruitment were besieged, such as the Mordian Iron Guard's planet being besieged by Zinch, or even Cadia, which was outright destroyed during the Black Crusade. Katachan, on the other hand, was attacked by a huge fleet of Cornate Space Marines, to which the jungle fighters laughed. A full-fledged demon invasion tore its way across the planet, but that only served to add more sport to the hunt for the Katachans. By the time the Indomitus Crusade made its way to the planet of Katachan, the jungle fighters had soundly destroyed the Chaos Forces, using their home court advantage to win the upper hand. I'm sure Robut Gilliman arrived on the planet to see the Katachans laughing and challenging each other to a contest of who could deadlift the dead Chaos Space Marine further or fastest or more often, whatever. But that really sums up the wide history and excellence of the Katachan jungle fighters. Known across the galaxy for their brazen attitude and intrepid behavior in the face of overwhelming odds, the Katachans are a testament to humanity's ability to adapt to any environment across the entire galaxy. Earning fear and renown in equal measure from friend and foe alike, Katachan jungle fighters will always be the stuff of legends when it comes to the Imperial Guard. Thank you so much for joining me on this fun-filled adventure through the lands of the rock-hard, hard, hard rock-blasting abs of the Katachans, guys. Hopefully you got a bit more information about these Schwarzenegger clones, but um, more contents, or I'm sorry, more uh, regiments to come. I know a lot of you guys have wanted uh, very specific ones like, like the uh, Mordian Iron Guard or the Sky Troopers, and I have uh, plenty more uh, planned in the weeks to come here, so uh, stay tuned. Be on the lookout for those, but as always, thank you so much for uh, watching. Have a good one and take care.